CloudDB, shaping your new normal. Hello everyone, welcome to this 2021 APAC Groundbreakers Virtual Tour by APAC COUC. Uh, this year, our event would be the biggest one ever done with 144 sessions, including normal sessions, workshops, and hands-on labs. From 100 different speakers over 17 days, also it would cover sessions in four different languages as well. So please remember to register to as many sessions as you can. I would like to say thanks to all Oracle user groups and Java user groups that made this event possible and also to our sponsors, Oracle Groundbreakers and our main sponsor, CloudDB. Now for today's session, we have cloud native application development, build fast, low TCO, scalable and agile software on Oracle. Uh, it's a workshop by Lucas Jalema. So feel free to write your questions at any time during the session at the chat window, and uh, the speaker would be answering them at the end of the session. Okay. So if you have any other issues during the presentation, please feel free to contact me at any time. Uh, we'll help you that. So now, without any more delays, I would like to leave you uh, with this amazing uh, session by Lucas Jalema. Okay, so over to Lucas. Thank you, Richard. And I hope you can see my presentation screen now. Yeah. Okay, good. So, cloud native application development and First of all, welcome to the session. You'll be stuck with me if you stay for the entire duration of the session for close to 90 minutes. And I'm sure that you already know what application development is. You may not be so familiar with the term cloud native and especially when applied to application development. So that's what we're going to talk about. Cloud native application development on Oracle Cloud or OCI, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. And we'll talk about, well, this topic because it allows us to build in a fast way, in an agile way, to build software which has low, low total cost of ownership and software that's extremely scalable. And software that's actually born in the cloud and was never used anywhere else or intended to be used anywhere else. So a little bit about myself. My name is Lucas Jellema. And I live in the Netherlands, and that's where I work as CTO at Amis. Uh, Amis is a company part of Conclusion, and Amis has been an Oracle partner for a little over 30 years. Um, so that's even from before I started working with Oracle, which I've done for a fairly long time. And I call myself a cloud solution architect. Uh, and Oracle calls me a groundbreaker ambassador and an Oracle Ace director. If you want to reach out to me, my contact details are on the slide and I will be happy to engage in any sort of conversation. Okay, enough about me. Um, let's talk about cloud and cloud native applications. And our castle on the cloud, our applications and infrastructure on the cloud, of course, require a physical foundation, even though we may think it's all ephemeral. It is not actually completely unfounded. We need a physical foundation. So when we look at the cloud, it's a stacked construction, if you like. And we only have to deal with those tiers in the stack that we actually require to deal with. And usually uh, they will be at a fairly high level. But just to understand what uh, what there is underneath our cloud. Let's take a brief look at the physical foundation. So at the lowest level, there is of course a building and that building needs to have power and it needs to have cooling. And there will be people cleaning the building. And in that building, there will be rack space. And 
this underpins any cloud. So even though we look at a cloud and we don't ever give it a second thought, how it's located, where it's located, it has to be located somewhere. And of course, that's part of the attraction of the cloud. Someone else has taken care of all these physical facilities. It's not our concern, but we can leverage them. So let's, let's no longer think about this physical foundation. Let's go to the next level. That physical foundation has also a security aspect to it. That's the next tier in the stack, if you like. That building that hosts, well, for, for the moment, only power supply and empty racks, uh, it's also physically protected uh, against people entering the building, people that are not allowed to enter the building or even approach the building. And the physical assets inside that building are protected. But there's also digital protection, digital security. So for, across a network, you cannot enter that building unless you have some form of authorization. And there will be both on-site and off-site archives with offline backups. That's part of the service too, but of course it requires a physical underpinning as well. And then there are different zones and you may be familiar with the terms uh, fold domain, availability domain and region. And in this order, they each add more um, disconnection, um, mere, more decoupling or even physical remoteness. Regions typically are far away from each other. Avail avail availability domains are also uh, physically re removed from each other. So part of what the cloud uses in terms of foundation is this security, both physically and digitally. Again, it's a tier that we don't really have to think about all that much, but it's good to know that it's there and it is what we are paying for. And it's something that we would have to take care of ourselves if we are not in that cloud. So moving up the stack, there's infrastructure. There's real physical infrastructure in, uh, in that data center. That's the underpinning for the cloud that we are, uh, we are using. So at this point, I'm not talking about infrastructure as a service because that's the next level up. I'm talking about the actual physical infrastructure that has to be in that, in, in that building. And there will be servers and there will be storage and there will be network and there will be people who have um, need to buy this equipment, who need to be trained on using the equipment, who need to install the equipment, monitor the equipment, patch it and, up, uh, and upgrade it and at some point replace it. And of course, the investment needs to be made. Now, all of this is something that we don't need to be aware of when we're using cloud services. At the same time, it's a good thing to be aware of all of this, to understand what's, what's happening and what is possible, but also what's not possible from the cloud services we're using. In the end, it's physical stuff. It's also good to realize how much work and how much investment is being made that we don't have to do and make ourselves. That's another attraction from using the cloud. Moving up, moving up to a tier that things may start to become interesting to us as users of that cloud, where we build our castle on the cloud. So the cloud, any cloud, oracles or any others, provides facilities, facilities that more or less come uh, out of the box. If you're on the cloud, then these facilities are available to you. Um, there are facilities in the area of operations for logging and monitoring whatever takes place on the cloud. And typically these are unified facilities and everything that happens on the cloud is logged, is monitored in the same way, is tracked in the same way. And we get cloud usage reports that cover all the cloud resources and notifications that are unified to alert us of anything in any cloud service um, of interest. Similarly, we have security facilities, identity and access management that take case of, a case of identifying, authenticating, authorizing all access to cloud resources. 
will have facilities in any cloud um, that do vulnerability scanning and certificate management that help us monitor uh, for security breaches. And then there will be facilities to manage our cloud resources, a UI, an API, a command line interface, a resource manager that supports infrastructure as code, automated ways of creating, managing and destroying our cloud resources, and something like cloud events that are published whenever something happens to one of the cloud resources that we can use to trigger automated facilities. So most clouds will offer these basic facilities and they exist whether we've got one cloud resource or many of them, regardless of the cloud service we're using. So that next level up, infrastructure as a service. That's where we don't typically have physical infrastructure. Although some services, some cloud vendors provide services, bare metal services that more or less make one of the physical pieces of hardware our own. Um, but most of the infrastructure as a service services um, describe virtual resources, software defined resources that we can use as if they were real. So we got servers, compute instances, um, virtual machines, um, storage, of course, and the storage services or the storage resources we get, uh, they will differ in how slow or fast they are, whether they are for long storage or short storage, whether they store objects or blocks. And usually we, get, we will get encryption out of the box. So no one working in that physical cloud center, even if they get access to the physical storage unit, can get access to our data. Network, same story. We'll get network resources. Um, underneath, you can think of routers and switches, but we don't really need to concern ourselves with that. We get logical network compartments and get internal networks and external network accessibility, either to go out or to allow external requests to come in. And we'll have support from the cloud vendor if we want, uh, if we want this for VPN tunnels and for interconnect uh, connections between different cloud vendors. So this is where we as consumers of the cloud start to build our castle on the cloud. Here we get services, here we get cloud resources, and here we can start deploying our custom logic. Then of course we can go, go up even higher in the stack uh, and leverage pass services or platform services. And underneath these platform services, typically there will be infrastructure components or resources, but not managed or configured by, by us. We're using what is typically a managed platform service. And you see examples on the slide here. The, uh, the, the red ones are all about data storage, data persistence, state management. The blue ones run jobs, uh, just like compute units would, but then more, more specific jobs like uh, containers or Spark engine um, jobs. So these platform capabilities, these platform components are usually quite powerful in helping us build our application. And I'm going to use resources like these uh, during my demonstration later on. So when we develop a cloud native application, we can build on these platform components, these managed platform components. That mean that creating the platform on which to run our application and configuring the platform is very simple. And managing that platform is done almost completely for us. So that's a major advantage uh, of acquiring cloud services. Well, we could even go higher in the stack. SaaS or software as a service and data as a service. So here we don't use generic infrastructure resources. We don't use more specialized, but still generic platform services, but we use ready to run functionality. So for example, ERP CRM applications or industry specific applications or specific um, functional applications like IoT device management or 
we consume specific data tailored to our needs. It has not been collected by us, it's not stored by us, it's not protected by us, but we can consume it. At this level, we only use the functionality and we don't have to develop software in order to do so. That's not the level I'm going to discuss in this session. We're going to go one level down again to build our own cloud native custom application on top of the platform that's provided for us in the cloud. So some of the characteristics of cloud native environments or cloud native applications, um, it's easy come, there should have been an E there, and easy go. It's very easy to quickly get an environment, a component, a resource, or even an application up and running, but it's also very easy to let go of it, to dispose it. And ephemeral, um, the only real state in our environment, well, there's only a few pieces. There's infrastructure as code, um, there's the configuration, and there's the business data, and of course, our own applications. And the rest is ephemeral. If we kill all the resources in our cloud, we can reconstruct them using the infrastructure as code, add the configuration, add the business data, and we are ready, uh, we are re ready to run again on the same cloud or potentially a different cloud. Part of the cloud native characteristics also is automation. We don't want to do anything by hand, especially not in a production environment. We automate things because it's quicker, because we make fewer mistakes, because it's, it's cheaper, um, and it allows us to dynamically scale and dynamically respond to changing conditions. Mm -hmm. Cloud native also comes with, or should come with elastic scalability to scale up and to scale down. Uh, and with scaling up and scaling down, we not only can handle a higher or lower volume, we also um, make sure that the cost is decreased uh, and increased as the um, traffic volume increases and decreases. So we pay for usage. And on the cloud, very unlike anything we can do on premises, we pay for the resources we use and for the amount of the resources that we use. And we don't pay for any fixed um, set of resources or any uh, high watermark, which we typically would have to do with licensed software, for example, or uh, the hardware units that we, well, you. You can't buy half a computer. You can buy a smaller computer, but if you have to have a certain capacity at one point in uh, in the year, your hardware capacity would have to be able to handle the load for that one peak in in the year. Not so in the cloud. Cloud native also asks for managed environment, an environment that's operated and maintained for you, so you don't have to have the skills. And you don't have to spend the time and effort on anything that's not related to your business specifically. So generic system engineering, uh, generic database operations, generic platform operations, um, that's something that you don't have to do in a cloud native world. And the facilities you get are enterprise grade. That's not just great, but also enterprise grade. And whether you are a large company, an enterprise that would have enterprise grade stuff anyways, or a small startup that can now benefit from the same greatness uh, as the enterprise because you can uh, run in a cloud native way, uh, you get the same level of quality. Democratization, sometimes this is called. Now, when it comes to cloud native custom applications, uh, we have a choice to make. And here, perhaps, the definition of cloud native um, has to be made specific. Um, you could say cloud native means go left. You go all in with whatever your cloud has to offer. If there is a SaaS solution, you take the SaaS solution. If there isn't one, you create a pass based solution with as many platform components as there are available. And these are far preferable over an infrastructure as a service based solution, a generic solution where you are uh, dealing with the underlying 
technological challenges yourself. You go go all in with your cloud vendor. And you, uh, you, you leverage whatever the cloud vendor has to offer to the max. This means you minimize the spend, you uh, the time you spend on non-functional IT things, anything that's not directly related to your functionality and your business challenges, and you accept the vendor login that comes with this approach. There's also the option of saying, well, it's cloud native. We create something that's completely tailored for the cloud, but we don't couple it to a specific cloud. We create a generic solution that's completely vendor agnostic and that can run on any cloud and it might even still be able to run on premises. Uh, usually this means using Kubernetes and creating your application components in containers and also uh, using platform components that come in containers. Usually, this also uh, means using a lot of open source te uh, technologies, not necessarily so, but in, uh, uh, typically that will be the case. However, this means that you have to accept a much higher management effort on all those platform components because they, they, they are now yours to manage. It also means that you need to have the skills and the people uh, and spend the time on managing those components. So in this case, you run on the cloud and you make use of many of the cloud facilities, the infrastructure as a service level, uh, a managed Kubernetes platform could be considered a platform perhaps, um, but you don't use from your cloud vendor managed databases or managed application server components or managed API gateways or managed um, other, pla other platform platform components, you install, configure, and operate them yourselves. So when you hear about cloud native application development, or you hear about the cloud native compute foundation, sometimes that means the right way, which isn't necessarily the right way, but it's the right side on the slide. And sometimes it means the left side on the slide, where you try to minimize anything any work that's not related to your business functionality. In this presentation, for me, cloud native applications are on the left side. So I go all in with the cloud vendor. And in this presentation, that cloud vendor is Oracle. So my use case today uh, is the following. Um, I look at Twitter and specifically tweets with a certain hashtag. And I want to create a cloud native custom application that retrieves the tweets that have that certain hashtag. And I want my custom application, my cloud native application, I want it to publish all those tweets to a stream. And the stream is like a queue. And in this case, it's a Kafka compliant stream. I also want records to be created in a NoSQL database for each of those tweets. And whenever a tweet report is assembled, I want to receive an email, an email notification. So I would like the custom application that we're going to talk about in this session, I would like it to do exactly this. Now, I'm going to quickly show you the final result. And then I will explain how that result, that final result that I'm going to show you, how that was created. So I need to change my share. No, no, go away. So I'm going to, to share my screen. And we're going to invoke an API. So this, uh, this API, this REST API, is the endpoint for the application, the cloud native application that I will be demonstrating later on. So I'm sending my request 
And at this point, the application is triggered from its currently sleeping state. It's the first uh, request in an hour. And that first request takes some time. So immediately after making that first request, I'll make a second request to give you a better feel for how, uh, for how long it takes. So we've done Oracle, let's do Java. There we go. And this is a, a, a far quicker response. Uh, you can see here the request had a hashtag Java and uh, it asked for all the tweets in the last 100 uh, minutes. It found 24 tweets and it has created a file called tweets-java- and then the timestamp. Okay, so that's what my custom application should be working on. And when I look at my email, uh, there are um, two emails. One says tweets-java and the other says tweets-oracle. So the email notification is there. Now let's quickly take a look in the Oracle Cloud. Let's quickly reconnect to the Oracle Cloud. So here I'm logging in to Oracle Cloud infrastructure. And this is my welcoming page. I'm in a trial and I will take a look at the stream to see whether Tweets were published to the intended stream. And here I'm in the stream and I'm asking now to load messages. And here I see the messages that have recently been created in the last minute. And you can see here the time, uh, 11.29 GMT, that's about a minute ago. Uh, and uh, he, here you can see the contents of the various tweets. And I'm trying to, there's Java as a hashtag. Okay, that's the streams. Now what I should have showed you before uh, starting the demo is this storage on um, this, uh, this bucket on object storage. And that's one of the services, the platform services within uh, Oracle Cloud. And it allows me to uh, create files, share files. I can, of course, download files. And here you see the two files that were created as a result of my two API calls. So there's two files now. Maybe I should make another call and show you that it will result in yet another. Let's try database. So looking at any tweets about database and there are 30 in the last 100 minutes. And now I expect an additional file to be created and there it is. Now the actual work that resulted in this file was done by a function. And more about functions later on. This function is part of this application, this cloud native application. And when I look at the the metrics for this cloud native application. And remember, metrics are part of the cloud facilities that I get out of the box. You will see here that at, um, in the last few seconds, there were, um, there have been, there have been executions um, of the function Maybe I should try to zoom in even further. Well, anyways, um, here's the function call. And another facility that I get out of the box uh, in this cloud environment is logging. So this application collects logging for all the function calls and it writes the logging to a central logging destination. And here are all the logs from all of the services. And in this case, I can see logging about NoSQL records being created. So these are the NoSQL records that have been created for the hashtag database. And I can go back and check at the logs 
that have been created a little bit earlier on. And I will also see the logs for the Java and um, Oracle hashtags. Now, are the NoSQL database records also created? Well, I simply type NoSQL and I get an overview of tables. And there's one table, that's the tweets table. And the tweets table is a NoSQL uh, table cre uh, created in the NoSQL Oracle Cloud uh, service. It has these columns and it has these rows. So I can run the query and I will find uh, all, the, um, all the tweet records that have been created uh, in this table. And I can add this where clause to the query in order to see only the tweets that have been created very recently. So here I see the tweets with hashtags Oracle, there will be Java, uh, and there will be database as well. Here's an example of database. So returning to my objective, to create a cloud native application that finds the tweets that has an, have an hashtag uh, that I specify, to create NoSQL table records, to create streaming messages and to send an email notification, it seems to be working. Now the actual code that I've written to do all of this, um, the code that's running the functions is over here. Uh, it's a Node application, Node.js, JavaScript application. And this is where uh, the functionality uh, actually resides. Now I want to show you what the development process looks like. So I'm going to make a very small change, um, a somewhat special message for this occasion. This is a change you will see later on. Uh, at, at this point, when I invoke the API, it will say no special message this time round. That's the current implementation. I've just changed the code to say a somewhat special message for this occasion. I'm also going to make another small change over here. Um, this is where I read the tweets from Twitter and create the Twitter JSON report. Now, before it had a field called author that just contains uh, the username on Twitter. And now I'm adding by and a copyright indication. So the author, author field in the tweets JSON report in the NoSQL table report and in the stream messages will be changed. Of course, not just by making a change in my local development environment. There's more needed for this. So I'm going to commit these changes to my source code uh, control system uh, with a not very good commit message, small changes in the APEC OGB21 demo. So my changes have been committed and now they are pushed. And pushed means that they are taken from my local development machine, my laptop, and they are pushed to the source code repository. In this case, that source code repository is on GitHub. And at the end of this presentation, I will give you the URL where you can, uh, that takes you to this GitHub repository to see all the code. What also happens at this point is that that GitHub code repository is synced to a code repository within Oracle Cloud. So there is an Oracle Cloud service that's called DevOps, and I will show you a little bit more about that later. And as part of this DevOps Cloud service, I have created a project. And in this project, I have defined a code repository. And this code repository contains the same code that you just saw um, on my local laptop. And it's synced with a GitHub code repository. And it was last synced 
well, almost this instance. So here I can see that the last commit that has been synced to the Oracle Cloud code repository is the one I just created on my laptop. Small changes in the APEC OGP 21, uh, 2021 demo. So the code is now in the cloud. And as a result, in my DevOps project, a build pipeline will have kicked off. So here's an overview of the build history. And here you can see two builds that are currently in, uh, in progress. And these builds are now automatically processing the change I made on my local laptop in this little piece of JavaScript code. And they are recreating the cloud native application. We'll give it some time. And later on, I will show you when you invoke the API that the changes will have been processed. First, we'll return to the presentation. So what's Oracle Cloud infrastructure? Well, Oracle has two clouds. It has a tier of cloud applications, the world of SaaS and data as a service. And it has what, not, what has been called the generation two cloud infrastructure. It supersedes what used to be called Cloud Classic, the first attempt of Oracle at the cloud and not very successful attempts. Um, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure uh, is what is now Oracle's technology cloud with infrastructure and platform services. And that's the cloud I'm using in this demo and talking about in this presentation. So, it's built on lessons learned, not just lessons learned by Oracle itself with Classic Cloud, but also lessons learned by many people who used to work for Amazon, who used to work for Microsoft Azure, who have come to Oracle to create a completely new cloud, benefiting from everything that has gone on before. So Oracle's cloud generation two cloud is not the first one on the market by no means. It's a quite late addition but it is one that has been built on all of these lessons that have been learned uh, elsewhere. The main themes for OCI, competitive pricing. And in any comparison you make, uh, Oracle seems to be very successful at this competitive pricing. It's secure by design from the ground up. It's open in terms of the, of the technology that have been used and the ways that you have to interact with, uh, with the cloud. And it's enterprise grade. And of course, Oracle has a long history of creating enterprise grade software. So this was ne not necessarily a big step for Oracle. You probably know about uh, the trials. You probably also know about the free tier where a number of cloud services are always free. And then there are many services that are not part of the free tier, but still offer a free tier. Uh, a free tier, so that can be used without having to actually pay any money. A quite recent report by Gartner uh, said, well, um, uh, among many things, the, uh, the following. Gartner believes that Oracle Cloud infrastructure is suitable for enterprise production use. Not everything that Gartner thinks should be in a cloud is currently available. Um, but most of the things that are important are there. And you can see how the Oracle Cloud compares to other clouds. So it has overtaken Google Cloud in terms of how many requirements from Gardner it meets. It's still uh, somewhat uh, lacking behind uh, Amazon, Azure, and also Alibaba. Um, whether this is in areas that are meaningful to you, of course, you will have to de uh, determine for yourself. But where until not too long ago, people were surprised to learn Oracle even had a cloud. This is a pretty important um, justification or, or uh, validation um, of OCI in, uh, in the eyes of uh, many of potential customers. And not just for using the database in the cloud, although that, of course, is Oracle's uh, main strong suit. So Oracle Cloud is physically located all across the world. Uh, here's an overview of the, uh, the various regions that are in action or that have been planned. Uh, and it's changing almost uh, all the time. You also see the Microsoft logo uh, on a number of um, locations. And that's where Oracle and Azure are interconnected and where you can use 
services from both cloud vendors that interact uh, with very low latency. It doesn't come for free, by the way. Uh, you will have to pay for uh, creating that interconnect, uh, but at least it's feasible and that's quite important. And I have a number, a number of customers that are using that or are considering to use it. So, well, you've seen the demonstration, you know what it does, uh, but now the question is, how was it implemented? And I've used a number of terms already. Uh, I've talked about stream and NoSQL database. I've talked about functions and applications. I may have mentioned the application gateway, or the API gateway. Uh, let's take a deeper look at what was used to put this solution together. So what you see here is the cloud native design of the application I was talking about. And you see a function and you see Twitter and you see an API gateway and an HTTP request, or at least this, an, this is an API, uh, an, an HTTP request. You've briefly seen the object storage service, the bucket that contains files. Here's the file. Uh, we've received the email notification. I've shown you logging uh, and I've briefly shown you the NoSQL database UI and uh, the messages on the stream. There are some other elements in this picture that are all part of the design. And as we'll discuss later on, there are just two elements on this, uh, in this design that we had to hand code. So that's high coding. Everything, everything else on here was low coding, was declarative definition of, for example, uh, the notification uh, triggering rules and the notification subscriptions. So in a cloud native design, what we strive for is custom code that we build in small units that are fairly independent of each other. So they can be independently built and tested and deployed and scaled up. And if they fail, they don't necessarily cause others to also fail. Therefore, we want to have asynchronous interactions and we want to leverage the managed platform with all its facilities, the facilities that help us, for example, do logging and monitoring and auditing and authorization. And all of the platform components are created. They are software defined. They are all created from code as well. So here are the different responsibilities for each of the components and each of the interaction arrows that you see in the solution design. I'm not going to go through them uh, in detail. The slides are available to you. So I mentioned before decoupling, and I think it's important that the various components in any application, but also of course in a cloud native application, that any component is independent of the other components, or at least insofar it can be in, uh, independent. We try to have asynchronous interactions, uh, decoupled interactions, instead of synchronous uh, interactions. Uh, and each component lives in its own runtime. So decoupling is uh, achieved through the encapsulation of implementations. You interact through an API, an interface definition. You don't give away any of the details of the underlying implementation and you decouple the runtime availability. Even if that other component is currently not available, I can still do my work as a component. And the result of my work is stored somewhere in an intermediate storage where it will become available for that other component as soon as it starts running again. I can release a new version of my component without impact on the other components. I can scale maybe to multiple instances my component without impact on the other component. Uh, I can handle more load or push more load to other components without them failing over and falling over. Uh, security boundary failure isolation. So in this solution design, this cloud native solution design, there are many decouple points, which I think is important. So all of these are decoupled points, at least at design time, and most of them at runtime as well. 
We don't have time now to go into detail, but believe me that here we have decoupling. So before we start creating the functionality, we create the platform. And based on the solution design, it's fairly easy to create the platform because we know all the components we need in the platform. And we do so using an infrastructure as code approach. So we apply automation to create all the platform components. And that has many benefits. One of the benefits is that you can use my code to create the exact same set of components on your cloud. Um, and I can also throw away my components and recreate the, uh, uh, the demo whenever I, I want. And I do so using uh, Terraform plans. And Terraform is an uh, industry-wide standard uh, tool for creating resources from infrastructure as code. And these are all the components that using Terraform uh, I have created. So let's very, very briefly take a look at what the code looks like. And I still have to prove, of course, that I just redeploy, uh, redeployed the functions. So here is um, a very simple uh, Terraform plan. It defines, defines a resource and that resource is of type NoSQL uh, no table. And here's the name of the resource. And here are the properties of the resource. And this resource definition is processed by the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Resource Manager when I run Terraform with the Terraform OCI provider. And the corresponding resource is created. And if I change one of the properties and rerun the file, then the uh, corresponding resource will be updated. Here's another file that contains the policies, the identity policies and the, the, the uh, definitions of the dynamic groups. If you don't know what they are, that's okay. Um, but by running this script, I prepare my cloud compartment, uh, my area on the cloud where this cloud native application will be created. I prepare it in terms of authorizations. And this is the Terraform plan that creates the functions, the functions that actually uh, perform the custom logic. So infrastructure as code. So the steps I go through in order to build my castle on the cloud and this specific application are, first of all, of course, I need to have a tenancy, an Oracle uh, cloud infrastructure cloud account and with it comes a root compartment um, it's like a big empty shed and then I want to create compartments um, and compartments are logical units uh, that can easily be separated from each other and in which we can uh, define access policies and uh, uh, get usage reporting, do logging. It's a, a little bit like uh, schemas in a database, logical separation between components. So by creating a tenancy and its first compartment, uh, I'm more or less setting up imaginary rec space in which I can then put my um, cloud platform components. So there we go. I've got a cloud. And I've got all the facilities that the cloud offers for anyone in the cloud out of the box. And in that cloud, I create my compartment. And this compartment currently is empty, but in this compartment, I will create my cloud native application. And then I run the Oracle Cloud Virtual Cloud Network Wizard to create a virtual network that sets up all the internal connections. Um, and to be honest, I don't know a lot about networking, not at a low level. Uh, so this wizard uh, helps me prepare uh, the environment, the compartment for the network-based interactions between the components. And then I use Terraform to create all the platform components. So I do the terraforming on the cloud uh, from the infrastructure as code scripts that I just showed you. And you could say that's the alternative to setting up servers and um, 
connecting the cables and installing the operating system images and configuring the networks and the firewall and installing all the software and configuring all the software. All of that is done by running a script. And this entire script takes about 12 minutes, I think, to complete. As I said before, everything is ephemeral. It comes and it could go. At this point, however, there's no custom functionality. So nothing actually uh, does anything that any business um, would appreciate. But these are the components that have now been created. And now it's time for me to create my functions. My functions that will leverage the object storage and the notification and the NoSQL database and the stream. So this is ready and now the custom functionality uh, and that will be done through high coding. And you've seen some of that code. Uh, it's, uh, it's Node.js code and it's deployed in what's called a function on OCR. And the first function reads from Twitter, uh, processes the tweets and create a file, creates a file on the object storage. A second function uh, will read that file and will create a NoSQL database record for each tweet and will uh, create a message on the stream also for each tweet. Then I will create a route on API Gateway. API Gateway is this component over here and it can receive HTTP requests from the outside world, from the public internet. And in this case, I need a route that will send certain requests to the function uh, in order to instruct the function to start retrieving tweets. I also need a cloud event rule that ensures that whenever a new document is created on the bucket over here, an event is triggered and it's pushed to a notification topic. And that notification topic then should invoke through a second rule, a function, and should also send the email that you've seen earlier on in my demonstration. So these are the custom code and the custom uh, configuration that I add for implementing the functionality I introduced earlier on in this presentation. What you also need to do is to add the Twitter credentials for uh, accessing the Twitter API to the vault. And of course, you also need to configure, configure the email address that the notification needs to be sent to. And I'm making use of OCI DevOps with a build pipeline, a deployment pipeline, and a code repository for creating the container images um, that are the foundation for the two functions. And that in order to get everything automated, I create something on my laptop, I push the changes, I sit back and relax. And maybe now is a good time to see whether those changes were actually processed. So if I create, if I invoke this again, um, let's see what the world has to say about Australia. At this point, the new definition of the function, the one I just created, should kick in. And I get a somewhat special message for this occasion. So this is good news. This means that the new definition uh, of my code was actually used to create a new version of the function that was now executed. And that means that when we check again uh, in the stream, uh, did I receive an email? Yeah, there's the email. So when we now check the stream, I would expect to see fresh messages. There they are. And in the fresh messages, uh, we should see the author, and here you have by Chris Gags, copyright 2021. So that change was processed as well. So what, what does that mean? As a developer, I write, I write code. And when that code is ready, and of course I should have done test, uh, I should have done testing and peer review, but by the time it's ready, I push my change and that change was processed fully automatically through a build pipeline and a deployment pipeline, and it's now running. 
um, I didn't touch production environment. And of course, no one in their right mind would want me to touch a production environment. Okay, a little bit more about serverless functions that really are the workhorse of Oracle Cloud infrastructure. And they look a bit tired, these workhorses. So let's change terminology and let's call them the worker bees of Oracle Cloud infrastructure. Any custom logic, well, maybe not everything, uh, anything that's long running should not be done in serverless functions. But anything that's short running should be implemented in serverless functions. Anything that you can't do using declarative configuration of platform components, of course, that is. So serverless functions on Oracle Cloud, and they exist on any cloud, and they are really important in any cloud. In Oracle Cloud, they are based on FN, Project FN, and Project FN is an open source function as a service platform. And you can just download it from GitHub, install it, and run it anywhere, on your own computer, uh, on premises, on any cloud. I'm not sure it's really used a lot outside of the world of Oracle. A function basically handles an HTTP request. Um, and then it does whatever it is supposed to do. Your functions are implemented using your own custom code. And they are packaged, and that's the way Project FN can run them at runtime when an HTTP request arrives. You package them in a container image, and that gets deployed. And Project FN supports out of the box uh, various uh, language runtimes, for example, for Go or for Java or for Node or for Python or Ruby. Uh, but you can also create your own custom Docker container uh, with your own runtime environment, which could be just Linux uh, that runs a shell script. So what happens? When a request gets handled, well, here we have our function, the implementation that we have created, uh, that's just custom logic. And we run it inside the Project FN uh, runtime environment. And there is this function development kit that provides the wrapper that allows the framework to send requests to our function. So when an HTTP request comes in, and of course, it has a method and it has headers and it has query parameters, or at least it could have. It has the URL path. It may have a body. Um, the FN framework or the OCI functions framework intercepts the request uh, and through the FDK hands it to our custom code. And then we start doing whatever we have to do, like retrieve tweets. In our function, we get access to the input that's whatever was sent in the HTTP requests body. And we also get access to the context. And in that context variable, uh, we can inspect the original HTTP request if we have to. Or we could say a number of things about the functions on Oracle Cloud infrastructure. They are stateless, or at least the mental picture is that they are stateless. A little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, Requests are load balanced. So whether there are a few requests or many requests, they can be handled up to a certain point. Uh, and we don't have to do anything about that. That's part of the, uh, of the cloud service. And the requests are routed in the right way. Uh, we don't have to do anything for that as well. Authorization can be enforced or is enforced. Not just anyone can invoke any function. That's part of the runtime framework. They are used for short running tasks. We can configure them with parameters that may differ between environments. So in your environment, different parameters than in mine, or in my test environment, different parameters than in my production environment. Um, they can start up rapidly, especially after the very first invocation. And you pay by, um, per memory usage times minutes or by, times time. Of the combination of the time that the, the functions combinedly have have run and the memory that they used. Functions in Oracle Cloud are all part of an application. An application is like a logical structuring of functions. And we do a number of uh, op operational tasks at the application level, such as the connection um, to a network and also the configuration of logging. 
HTTP requests trigger the execution of functions. And almost always, I think, we will, uh, we will make use of a component called the API gateway that can take HTTP requests that come in from the public internet and route them to a specific function. The API gateway also performs logging, can be used for analysis and do authorization uh, to make sure that the functions uh, from the outside are only invoked by anyone authorized to do so. As I said before, the functions automatically benefit from a number of facilities in the Oracle Cloud and you don't have to implement anything in your code in order to leverage these uh, facilities, apart, of course, from writing logging. Otherwise, there is no logging to collect and analyze. And we can make use of OCI DevOps um, to uh, automatically handle the development, build, and deploy process of our functions. Well, a little bit more about the mental picture that I mentioned before. Um, we consider our functions to be stateless and serverless. Um, and while that mental picture is correct, there's a little bit more nuance to it uh, than just our own code programmed in whatever uh, programming language we fancy. So to our, function, uh, to our code, uh, the FDK is added and we can keep it completely separate from our code. So we can create our code without having to think about that FDK. Uh, but it will be there at runtime. Uh, and at runtime, our code will be packaged together with the FDK uh, in a container image. That's not a problem, but it's something that we, to a certain extent, have to be aware of. So when our function is executed, what, what gets executed is not just our code, but it's our code together with an FDK uh, inside a container that's running on a container uh, engine and that gets injected at runtime the config uh, configuration parameters. So these are set well when we deploy the function and they are not part of our definition, or at least not the values of these parameters are part of the definition. So the build process, we take our code, we add the FDK, we add the container, um, the base container image that currently uh, is using Oracle Linux 8, a slim version before it used to use Alpine, but now it's using Oracle 8, um, the slim version. Uh, so that's added in, in, into the container image. The language runtime that we require is added and the FDK is added. And then our own custom code is added. And that becomes the container image that will be deployed uh, as, uh, as as function. So this container image is pushed to the container image registry that could be our own, but in the case of Oracle Cloud, it will be the container image registry on OCI. And that's where the function can then be deployed from. So when we deploy the function, we take um, that container uh, image from the, uh, from the, the registry. We can specify the shape that we are going to use to run this function with uh, the, the memory shape uh, starting at 120 megab uh, megabytes we can go up all the way to one gigabyte and of course the bigger shape we choose the more we will have to pay now after we have deployed the function it's not actually running yet it's there ready to run but it will only run when there is a request for that function when that request comes in, Oracle functions on OCI will automatically start a container. Uh, but of course that takes some time. So the first time a function is invoked, it takes longer as you saw before for the function to respond than as, uh, when it has been invoked several times. What happens when the function um, is started or well, the Docker container is started and whatever in uh, initialization needs to be done for the runtime of our application is also performed. Uh, of course, it's running on a container orchestrator and that's running inside a VM and that's running on a real server, a physical server. So even though the mental picture is that all of this is serverless, it's actually not. 
Um, we can make use of the fact that our runtime, uh, that we know some things about our runtime. There is a file system, for example, that we can write to. And uh, only in the directory slash TMP, by the way. And it can be read as well. All the configuration parameters that have been defined either for the application or for the function are available as environment variables. So the request is handled and we'll write our login and our metrics, etc. And another uh, and the re response is returned. And it can be uh, we have this mental picture of all of this being stateless. So the function runs and when it's completed, all its state is vanished. And that's not entirely true, as it turns out. The container is actually kept running for 10 to 15 minutes. There's no guarantee on this, uh, but it's kept it's kept running. So when an, uh, another request comes in, it can be handled very quickly instead of having to fire up container from the beginning. And during this 10 to 15 minutes, it will retain its global state and it will retain anything written to the file system. And you can make use of, of this knowledge. So if you have a function, um, the function isn't strictly stateless. Anything you define in global variables um, will be available probably for across many function invocations. And by the way, once the container is done processing a request, you will have about 10 to 13 seconds uh, before um, the process instance is no longer available. Uh, maybe this is, this is too much of detail. So here we go. What's the mental picture? We got one request container is started. It will handle the request and another request comes in and the same container instance can handle that request. And another request comes in and the same container instance can handle that request. However, when there are many requests, the Oracle Cloud functions orchestrator may determine that a second container instance is needed and your function is then uh, running in two different container instances. And these two do not know about each other. They don't share anything. They don't share state. They don't share anything. And it can handle requests. There might even be a need for a third container instance to also help handle all the requests to the function. And that one may be started on a, in a different VM that's running on a different server. And of course, uh, this third instance doesn't share anything with the other two instances. How many instances can there be? Well, there can be quite a few. Um, it depends on the limit that's specified for your tenancy. And the default limit is 30 gigabytes of RAM that can be used by all of your function instances across all of your functions combined. It can be extended if you want to. Uh, this is, by the way, per availability domain, uh, but you would have to uh, talk to Oracle support about that. So what, what does it cost, cost to run your function? Well, not very much. Um, there's no charge for idle time. So all the time your container is running, but it's not actually doing anything, you don't pay for that. You only pay for the time the container is actually doing any work. And that usually will be a few seconds at the most. And then it depends on the, uh, the multiplication of the time your function is doing stuff and the memory shape that you have assigned for that function. But it's important, as you can see on this slide, that the first 2 million invocations, function invocations in each month are free. And well, in my environment, that's plenty. Uh, you do, do not only pay for invocations, you also pay for the execution time. That's where the multiplication, multiplication happens between uh, the time spent and the memory used. And the first 400,000 gigabyte memory seconds um, are free as well. So if you use a small shape and you re respond within one or two seconds, that amounts to almost the same number of free function invocations. After that, you start paying. The, the amount you pay is still fairly small. By the time it gets serious, you may consider bringing your function, your custom code 
that you have put inside your function uh, and bring it to, for example, a Kubernetes cluster and there have it running um, permanently rather than server and statelessly. Well, the execution of a function can be triggered, as we have seen, by an HTTP request, but also in various other ways. Um, there's, of course, the FN tooling that, uh, that you can use. It's a command line tool that you can run, for example, in OCI Cloud Shell, and from there you can trigger your function. An auth authenticated signed HTTP request is required to trigger the function, or much easier, any HTTP request that's handled by API Gateway. Then a function can be triggered by the events service within uh, Oracle Cloud from an, a notification topic. And the notification topic itself can be triggered, for example, from an event or from an alarm. And you can use a service connector to connect uh, log files and messages on streams uh, and use these also to trigger function execution. Well, a function can also be executed from a Terraform plan. So if you run the Terraform plan to create infrastructure as code, as part of that, you can invoke a function. And you can use a function in a deployment pipeline to help you uh, do some of the more detailed steps in a deployment. And you could say that functions are used both to provide functionality in your custom applications, as well as to help out with the automation of your operations of the cloud environment. So functions are used in different ways and maybe even by, well, it's the same team, it's a DevOps team, so it's the same people too. From your functions, you can make use of all of the services on Oracle Cloud and functions can easily be configured to be allowed to make those calls. So even no, 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 I'm not going to make it more complex than it is. So your function could call out to API Gateway to trigger another function. Um, and that would be a synchronous interaction between functions through the API Gateway. You could also, from a function, publish uh, a message to a notification topic, and that can either um, uh, result in email delivery but also in triggering execution of a function. And that will be asynchronous interaction between functions in your cloud native application. Well, from a function, you can also call out to these services and to all other services as well, but these are the obvious ones to use to publish a message on a stream, to create a NoSQL database record, as you've seen in my demo, to read or to create a, a, an object on object storage, to interact with the autonomous database with autonomous JSON, a data store and to, for example, read secrets from the key vault, as I've used in my demonstration to read the Twitter credentials from the key vault. Uh, functions leverage the cloud facilities, as I've mentioned before. Um, one thing I won't go into detail about, but you should be aware of, uh, Oracle Cloud has a fairly advanced system for defining authorizations. Uh, it's done through policies. And if you do not, and you could be a human user, but can also be uh, a function, if you don't have the permission to invoke a certain service or to invoke a certain service in a certain context, then any attempt to make that call will fail, as of course you would expect. Now we can grant permissions to a function to invoke specific OCI services, um, and that's done through the, uh, the concept of a resource principle. We can create um, a dynamic group. I mentioned that before. Um, we can create what's called a dynamic group and assign that dynamic group certain permissions through a policy. So this policy will say something like the dynamic group is allowed to call um, the object storage service in this compartment. That's typically what a policy could say. And then by uh, specifying rules, we can make sure that our function or all our, all our functions or all functions in a certain application or in a certain compartment um, are member of the 
dynamic group, dynamic group is very similar to a role in the Oracle database. Um, maybe I shouldn't make that comparison. It's just a dynamic group. And dynamically, Oracle Cloud determines which resources are part of that group. And if the resource that's trying to make a certain OCI service call, if it's part of a group, then OCI will check whether that group through policies has certain permissions. And among those permissions has the permission to make the call to, in this case, the object storage service. May sound a bit complex, but it's actually very elegant. What's also good to know is that at runtime in the Oracle Cloud environment, a function will automatically get access to a, a private key that can be used to make calls to all the OCI APIs. Uh, I have a blog article describing this in more detail. And of course you can find it in the sources uh, used for the demos in, in this presentation. So I mentioned this before, uh, the functions are Node.js applications. Uh, they are, have been developed as standalone applications on my laptop and I can run them on my laptop just to, to, to test them and to check whether they're working. Uh, and then from a code repository, they, are, they go through a build pipeline and they are turned into container images. And then a second pipeline, a deployment pipeline, take those container images uh, and refreshes the function with the new definition of the container image. Uh, that, that is what you saw more or less in action after I made a change to the code and pushed that change to the code repository. Oh, to drill down a little bit more on how I implement the functionality, and this is basically a readme for the code, uh, the function tweets, uh, tweet summarizer um, is triggered uh, through the HTTP request I send to the API gateway. And then it goes out to the vault to get from the vault the key or the secret, I should say, the secret that contains the Twitter credentials. Um, so I can't read those credentials. They are in my vault and, well, they are protected in the vault. They have been uh, encrypted and no one gets access except, well, the function when it runs inside Oracle Cloud, then it is allowed to get secrets out of the vault. That doesn't mean that I can see them. It's inside my function. Unless, of course, in my function, I would write uh, logging that contains the contents of the secret. That would be a big, 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 big no-no. Uh, when I got the Twitter credentials, I can call out to the Twitter API. The um, tweets are retrieved and the object storage API uh, is called to create an object in the bucket that contains the tweets. This function, as I said, is exposed to external callers through the API gateway. And after it has written the object on object storage, how then is the email notification triggered? I think I sort of gave that away already. Um, that's something that we do using events and notifications. So we can configure the bucket on object storage to publish cloud events whenever new objects are created. And I can also create a rule to publish to a notification topic whenever such a cloud event is, uh, is published. And on that notification topic, I can create a subscription that publishes, of, that sends out an email whenever uh, an event on that notification topic is consumed. So a little bit more about the events and the notifications. On the left side, you see many different OCI services and all of them can cause resource change events. And the event service uh, can bring those events to a notification topic or to a stream or to a function. And in this case, we've used, I've used a notification topic. So an OCI resource does something, is changed in any way, a cloud event is published. And because of a certain event rule, uh, that cloud event is used to publish on a notification topic or call a function or publish an event, a, a message on a stream. 
that notification topic can have subscriptions and these subscriptions can well send a message to uh, PagerDuty or to Slack, uh, invoke a URL as a webhook, send an email, invoke a function uh, or publish a message on a stream. And in this case, of course, we send an email. So there's the cloud event and the cloud event in the end causes the email to be sent. Uh, functions and alarms can also publish to notification topics, by the way. Well, the rule that was set up, and maybe this is a little bit too much detail for the session, but here we see the event type is object storage, object create. More specifically, it's on the bucket that's called Twitter reports. So whenever an object is created in this bucket, a cloud event is published. And an action associated with this particular cloud event is to publish a notification to this notification topic. Almost there. Then a subscription is made on the notification topic of type email uh, using my email address. And after I have confirmed that I want to allow Oracle Cloud Infrastructure to send notifications to my email address, then um, this subscription is active. And well, here is the subscription and it now has the status uh, active. Then now when I invoke the API on the API gateway, the function is triggered, the tweets are retrieved, the report is written, there it is. The event is triggered, the notification is activated and the email is sent. And there's the email. And we can see that for the hashtag Lady Gaga, the report is tweets Lady Gaga and that's what the email tells me. So the circle is sort of round. And then the notification can also trigger a function and the function will create the records uh, based on the tweet report that it retrieves. Uh, here are the records as we've seen earlier on in a demo and it will also publish on streams. And that looks like this as we've seen before. Okay, time for a summary as we are in the last four minutes of the session. Here we see the overall solution and only a few pieces in this solution actually had to be created by me. Many of the pieces on this picture are just out of the box cloud facilities. Some of the resources on this picture were created using infrastructure as code. And while it took some time to create the Terraform plans, executing those plans is very, is very simple and hands off. And then I only had to implement a few custom things, the functions, the API gateway route, the rules for the event and notification uh, and the uh, Twitter credentials in the vault. That's basically it. So cloud native, and that means that we pay for use. All of what I've shown you didn't cost me a penny. I'm in a free trial. And after today, I'm going to remove everything from my compartment and I, there's nothing there. So you won't have to pay anything. But even if I leave it there, as it doesn't do much, it will still not cost a much or anything because it's a free trial. So pay per use is a very important concept. And as a cloud architect, the, uh, the title I've assigned to myself, it's very important to deal with this new concept of pay per use. Switching off things at night times if nothing happens at night times. Uh, scaling down things when uh, there's uh, only little traffic, scaling up things when there is a, a, a lot of traffic. So money has become a very important consideration in solution designs, and that's fairly new for most of us. Before we just spent money on the licenses and then we could do whatever we wanted within those licenses. And of course, many facilities weren't available to us because of the licenses that were far too expensive. So in addition to the elastic pricing, we also can benefit from the always free tier on Oracle Cloud and the first X free in addition to the free tier. And the fact that per unit, many things are really very cheap. 
So only if you use a lot and it gives a lot of value, you pay a lot, which then is fair enough. So what are, what are the other aspects of the cloud nativeness, the cloud nativity coming to the Christmas season? Um, we use platform services that are managed for us. And we can think in terms of serverless, even if the, um, underlying the R service, we can use our infrastructure as completely serverless. Very quick provisioning of resources and very easy decommissioning of resources. There's no lead time of weeks or months or even days. It's a lead time of minutes. We think in a distributed application model, uh, components that are decoupled from each other. We think in automated ways of working uh, during development and certainly during operations. Pay per use, mentioned that. Our vendor has now become part of our runtime. And that's new. That's new for the vendor. That's new for Oracle. We used to run our databases. Oracle didn't take part in that. But now Oracle is managing our databases and is managing our compute infrastructure, is managing our network, is managing our security. So we have to rely much more uh, on Oracle than we did before. We can rely much more on Oracle than before. They take responsibility. We get enterprise grade facilities, even if we are just a startup. Uh, and we don't even have to pay for it if we don't use a lot. Security and availability facilities are built into our cloud infrastructure, are very easy to make use of. And things that used to be extremely hard and ex extremely expensive are now fairly easy to do and fairly cheap to do. We can easily grow to a larger scale and also scale down again. Uh, and we've got all these operational facilities out of the box available to us. It's a wonderful world, isn't it? This allows us to do rapid innovation for ourselves and also benefit from the rapid innovation that our cloud vendor will perform. Uh, Oracle is adding services every week almost, or at least new features to all the services. And we don't have to wait for the next release in a year and a half. It will be there in the next month. Thank you for your attention. And I really hope this has been useful to you, at least some of it. Um, here's the URL for the slides and the sources for my demo. If you have any questions, any remarks, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I would be happy to get into a conversation with you. And with that, I'll hand it back to Richard. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Lucas. Thanks for your time. And uh, it's really a very good, great knowledge. And uh, there is no such uh, question answer in the chat box. So I think we can uh, close the session. So thanks, uh, Lucas. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation today. And please do not forget to register for other uh, sessions in the conference. Please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. CloudDB, shaping your new normal.